Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this morning, we are going to be starting a two-week two mini-series on the Sermon on the Mount, what it means, uh, how, how it applies to us. I think, you know, I think that's certainly up there in terms of like most popular, most oft-quoted texts in the Bible. And we are joined in this uh, discussion, uh, who will be led by uh, Professor Dale Allison. He is the, uh, the Richard J. Dearburn Professor of New Testament at Princeton Seminary. I had the joy of having Dale Allison when I took intro to New Testament um, and learned a lot about the historical Jesus, which is where a lot of his work is. Um, he has written a book on the Sermon of the Mount. Um, he wrote a book, Constructing Jesus, which is about who the historical Jesus is. Um, he has another book coming out in 2021 on Jesus's resurrection. So he's done a lot of work with the gospels and with Jesus and how we can understand Jesus. And he is also a, an ordained Presbyterian elder and he will be speaking for about 45 minutes, giving us some introduction. You're welcome to throw your questions in the chat or save them to the end, and then we can we can talk about this. So with that, uh, Dr. Allison, thank you for being here and take it away. Okay, thanks, Courtney. Good morning, everybody. Uh, what I have to do this week and next week is um, introduce the Sermon on the Mount, which is not easy. It's not easy to introduce it. Um, because the Sermon on the Mount itself is not easy. Uh, it's three chapters of the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, even if you have no real sense for those three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the, the Lord's Prayer that you, you uh, recite every Sunday is from that. The Beatitudes are from that. It is also, though, primarily full of imperatives or moral injunctions that is, it's a collection of things that Jesus asked people to do. And it includes be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. It includes turn the other cheek and go the extra mile. It includes do not swear, do not take an oath at all. It includes... Um, from a, a male perspective, don't look at a woman uh, in the wrong way because that's the same thing as adultery. It also says no divorce except for adultery. So those are the some of, some of the imperatives that it has in it, commands of Jesus. And these are difficult. These are actually problems. So you all hear the Beatitudes and they're, they're lovely and isn't that wonderful. But when you hear the sorts of sayings that I just quoted, your response is not, isn't that wonderful or beautiful? Your response, if you're listening carefully, is what on earth can that mean? Uh, so if you, if you read through the book of Proverbs, you're constantly saying, oh, that makes sense or I understand, or I like that. If you read, go to the ant, uh, oh, oh slugger and sluggard and study her ways and learn, and you'll figure out that laziness is bad and you have to work. And you know, if, if you want certain things, uh, you gotta try. And you all read this and you all say, sure. Yeah, I got it. When you read Jesus here, your response, I think, actually should be, what on earth is he talking about? So I want to introduce uh, the sermon by giving you some quotations from people who've looked at the sermon, and they've said such things as this. So the first one is from Dostoevsky's uh, Brothers Karabatsov, and here we have the Grand Inquisitor in that, the famous chapter that features him, and he says this at one point, and, and this refers to the, the sayings that I just quoted. Jesus judged humanity too highly, for it was created weaker and lower than Christ thought. What he's saying is, is that 
Jesus gives us commandments that nobody can live up to. All right, that's what he's saying. He's complaining. He's saying Jesus thinks we can do this, but we can't. Here is a quotation from Peter Berger, the famous sociologist, who, by the way, is a Lutheran. Any society larger than an Amish village would not survive for very long if it tried to live by the Sermon on the Mount. Can't do this, folks. Here is a comment from a 20th century British politician. The Sermon on the Mount is for bachelors, those with no responsibility for future generations. I see some smiles out there, but this is actually serious. People are reading this and saying, this makes no sense. Here's a uh, 20th century British philosopher. Jesus's teaching is not shrewd. It simply makes unreasonable demands of the utmost generality of a kind that any purveyor of mental health would recommend that his patients disregard. But you don't want to tell people to do this stuff. Now, these complaints, they go all the way back to the second century. And there's a second century Christian writer who quotes a Jew, a Jew who's critical of Jesus and Christianity. And at one point, he makes the, the, the Jew, he makes this ironic statement. He says, I am aware that your precepts are so wonderful and so great that nobody can keep them. They're so fantastic, so wonderful, that they're irrelevant. Nobody can, can live them. So this has been called the ultra piety of, uh, of the Sermon on the Mount. What, what is Jesus doing? What's the point? What can he be um, thinking? Uh, what would happen if you loved your enemies? Do you love foreign armies? Do you love terrorists? Do you love murderers? Those are enemies, aren't they? Uh, do you turn the other cheek when they show up? Does it make any sense? When thieves steal something, you say, here, have some more? Is that, is that how you deal with thieves? Is that how you want other people to deal with thieves? Yeah, you took my coat. Here's, here's the cloak also. Have what you want. Um, what's wrong with taking an oath in the courtroom? I've been to court. I, I actually took an oath. I swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Maybe some of you have done the same thing. So uh, was, I, was I disobeying Jesus when I uh, did this? Again, some of you have been to court. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, Jesus has no divorce except for adultery. Is that really the only thing? And is that the worst thing? And does this make any sense? Um, I knew a woman. Actually, I, I guess I should just uh, say this is my wife. So I'm her second husband. She thought that her first husband was committing adultery, but he denied it. So if she'd gone to her pastor, what was he supposed to say? Was he supposed to say, well, uh, do you know that he's committed adultery? Um, well, I guess her answer would be, I, I think it's likely, but I don't have any proof and he's denying it. So does the pastor then say, well, uh, sorry, you're just stuck with him until you can hire a PI and get, uh, get the documentation on this. And by the way, what is so bad about adultery? What if you find out your husband is an ex murderer? Is that allowed as a good cause? But it's not listed here. It just says adultery. So I can think of, actually, I can think of a lot of things that are worse than adultery, but they're, they're, they're not listed here. So, so what do you do with this? Okay, the point is, is that Christians aren't stupid and they've read this thing for a long time and they recognize that there are questions and there are problems and there are really, really, really difficult issues here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start out by paying attention to the tradition. In other words, I want to look at what some people have said about the Sermon on the Mount. 
And I want to do that before I stand back and give you some suggestions of my own. Okay. So I want to see if we can learn anything from what other people have said. So I'm actually going to start here with um, Leo Tolstoy, who represents a really interesting and important approach to the Sermon on the Mount. By the way, uh, once when I was lecturing on the Sermon on the Mount years and years ago at a university, I just referred to Leo Tolstoy and a woman raised her hand and said, who is that? And my response was uh, a Russian novelist. And this young woman came up during the break. If you want to worry about uh, the state of education in our country, um, this is fodder for you. So. In class, I said, he's a Russian novelist. She came up during the break and she said, she said, what is a novelist? This woman was in college. She was a college student. I didn't make up that little uh, anecdote. This really happened. And uh, that's not good. She had graduated from high school and was in a college class I was teaching. Anyway, that has nothing to do with anything. So Leo Tolstoy represents what's called um, an absolutist approach to the Sermon on the Mount. And what this amounts to is uh, taking it as literally as possible. Now, he is a novelist. He had a great imagination. He knows you can't take everything literally. But he believes in trying to push the literal imperatives as far as possible. So when he wrote about this command that you don't swear at all, you don't take an oath, he said, you know what? All courtrooms have oaths. All courtrooms demand that people swear. It's just one of the foundations for judicial law. And Tolstoy said Jesus is actually implicitly abolishing law courts here. There's no place for law courts in the Sermon on the Mount. And he said there's no place for police or armies in the Sermon on the Mount. If you're a police officer, or if you are in the army, you can't turn the other cheek. You can't go the extra mile. You can't love your enemy. You have to shoot your enemy. So Tolstoy said that this is implicitly abolishing police forces and government uh, armies you cannot join if you want to follow Jesus. They're antithetical, okay? He's being really, really radical here, folks. Also, Jesus says, don't store up treasure on the earth. Now, my guess is that some of you have retirement accounts and bank accounts, and you've stored up some treasure on the earth. Maybe you have some properties you've invested in and so on. Tolstoy said, no, if you don't store up treasure on the earth, it means you don't store up treasure on the earth. He says, it's not difficult. He just meant what he said. And by the way, Tolstoy was pretty well-to-do. Uh, and he did give away everything he had to the peasants. Uh, but I, I, you can't admire him too much because he waited till he was almost dead, the last year of his life or thereabouts before he decided to give everything away. But my point is, he's really radical, folks. He's really Radical, y'all getting this? Yeah, I don't hear any amens. I don't hear any amens out there. Amen, um, brother. <laughs> Hearing you. Uh, by the way, I don't want to get into contemporary politics right now, but uh, he would have been all for defunding the police. Uh, Tolstoy would have been just fine with that. Okay. He also he also argued against anger which is quite ironic because he had a terrible temper and he never really managed to, uh, to control it and fix it. He also took Jesus's prohibition of lust to mean that um, you should try as far as possible to control your uh, sexual appetites. He also did a very poor job of that as we know from his wife's uh, journaling. Uh, he would, he would try to stay away from his wife and then he would fail. Anyway, uh, now I pick him because um, one, he's famous. Two, he's been very influential. Actually, there's a, a fascinating uh, history here. 
If you look at Martin Luther King and his philosophy of nonviolence, he is getting most of it from Gandhi, and Gandhi is getting it from Tolstoy's reading of the Sermon on the Mount. I've always thought that's a really fascinating uh, uh, a line of, of influence there. Uh, Tolstoy to Gandhi, Gandhi uh, to King. Anyway, most people have looked at this and they've thought, this makes no sense. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stand back from Tolstoy and, um, and I'm going to share with you what people have made of it. That is what his critics have said, okay? And by the way, I'm a, a critic. I, uh, I do store up a little treasure on the earth and I don't fall in line with all of Tolstoy's uh, interpretations of the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> anyway, Tolstoy was a pacifist. And I remember a Bible study I was in in college and we were reading um, a Mennonite ethicist, John Howard Yoder, and a famous book, The Politics of Jesus. And he was arguing that we should be pacifists. Now, while we were having this Bible study, uh, this was in Wichita, Kansas, and I was in college. Uh, a sniper went up on a downtown roof. Uh, this was Kansas. So at that time, the tallest building in Kansas was 25 stories high. And he went up there and he started shooting at the people below. And the next week after this had happened, we had a discussion because we were reading John Howard Yoder. And then we had this episode in our city and we had a debate, what is the right thing to do? And there were a couple of people who were dedicated pacifists and they said that what everybody should have done was pray. That's it. And I remember thinking at the time that that, that doesn't, cut it for me. I'm actually happy that the police shot the man. They shot the man in the legs. They stopped it. He's still in prison today. I was quite happy. I was quite happy that um, they shot him. But um, I had uh, some friends in this little study group who thought, no, that was the wrong thing. Also, a few years ago, to illustrate what, what can happen here, um, I was having breakfast with a well-known uh, biblical scholar, a man named Richard Hayes, who had written a, a book on uh, New Testament ethics. And um, he takes a pacifistic position. He agrees with um, John Howard Yoder in this book that Christians should always eschew violence. So I decided, well, heck, I'll just ask him the throwaway question that you always ask pacifists when you, 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 you get to talk to them, right? So here's a famous pacifist. And so I said, Richard, what, what happens tonight when you come home, you walk in the front door and there's a man uh, who is assaulting your wife. And uh, let's say she's being raped. You walk in on this scene. What do you do as a, uh, as a, as a Christian pacifist? And I thought that this is the sort of thing that he would have uh, thought about, given that he'd written as a pacifist. And he, he took almost 30 seconds or more uh, and paused. And you know what he told me? He said, well, Dale, he said, I would pick up the fireplace poker and I would bash his head in, but I shouldn't do it. That was his answer to me. And I thought there's something wrong here, right? There's just something that doesn't quite makes sense if you can't if you can't yourself live by this. So one of the constant complaints about the sort of absolutist position that Tolstoy took was uh, you have to protect the innocent. And if this does not allow you to protect the innocent, then um, there's a, a problem here. Okay. So a second criticism of, of Tolstoy is that um, Right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, it's Jesus says, I came not to abolish the law and the prophets. I didn't abolish them. I came to fulfill them. So you, you have to do what the law and the prophets say. Now, that little section, that little paragraph saying, don't throw away the Old Testament, comes right before turn the other cheek and go the extra mile and so on. It's almost as though somebody is saying, whatever you make of these 
sayings that, that follow, they can't throw away the Old Testament, which does have armies and uh, courts and all the stuff that Tolstoy wanted to get rid of. So I actually think that's a good exegetical argument. I think that the Sermon on the Mount as it stands actually cautions you against being too radical because it says Jesus isn't throwing away the law and the prophets. Um, and then two more things, just very briefly. Historically, it is the case that people who have tried to live like this have tended to be on the margins of, uh, of society. So I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, and there's a place called Newton, Kansas, which is just north of, of Wichita. And traditionally, it's a Mennonite community. And the Mennonites did not, did not live in Wichita. They formed their own little group so they could follow their own way of life, which contradicted the, the, the way of life of most of the people in the cities. Historically, the people who are closest to Tolstoy would be Amish, uh, would be Mennonites, would be people like Francis of Assisi, who had some trouble adjusting to the mainstream culture in his own, in, in his own time. And here's the, here's the last point I want to make uh, about this way of thinking. You just can't be literal about this. It just doesn't work. So I... I had a student uh, come into my office one day. He was already pastoring a church. By the way, this wasn't here at Princeton. This was in Pittsburgh. He came in one day and he said, Professor, I'd like to, to talk about some things and, and, and share some questions that I have with you. He proceeded to tell me one of the strangest stories I have ever heard. So he was a pious Christian and his wife was a pious Christian, and he knew that Jesus had said in the Sermon on the Mount that you can't get divorced unless there's been adultery. Now, he wanted a divorce, but he hadn't committed adultery, and his wife hadn't committed adultery. So he knew they were just stuck with each other, but he didn't want to be stuck with his wife. So how could he obey Jesus? How could he obey Jesus? And what this man told me is he got some money and he apparently knew where the local house of, we used to call it a house of ill, Ill repute. I don't know what they call them today. I, I, I don't know anything about them. Anyway, he actually went down there, paid someone some money, had sex in obedience to Jesus, went home and said, now we can get divorced. Now he had decided after this, that there must be something wrong with this, right? He did have the sense eventually to think that that makes no sense, but this is actually what he did. And uh, this, this is a wonderful illustration, which says that maybe, maybe there has to be some common sense somewhere in here, right? Maybe you can't just have unimaginative readings. Okay, so that's one, one, one way to, to, to think about the Sermon on the Mount, be as literal as possible. Uh, take a sort of absolutist approach. By the way, I do admire people who can live like this. I admire the, the Mennonites. I admire the Amish. I admire Francis of Assisi. I admire people who live like this. I just don't want to do it myself. And I sometimes tell my students, I would be happy if everyone in the world were Amish except me. Wouldn't the world be a better place if everyone were Amish except me? Because I don't want to be Amish. But uh, maybe we wouldn't have the wars we have, right? Maybe, uh, maybe things would be better. So that's not a practical uh, approach to things. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go on to a second approach. Um, but by the way, I do want to emphasize Tolstoy knows how radical he is here. He senses that if we take Jesus seriously, we're, we're not going to be in an army. We're not going to be police officers. We're not going to have courts. Uh, we're going to have very different uh, sexual mores, and, and uh, we, we're going to have uh, communes and shared property and so on. He knows how radical this is, okay? So here's the second approach, and it's associated primarily with medieval Catholicism, and uh, people don't take it seriously these days, but I'm going to argue there's something really important here. So 
this traditional approach is called the monastic approach. So if you want to keep track of this, the first is the absolutist, the second is the monastic approach, because it's associated with medieval Catholic monasticism primarily. And so what they noticed is that Jesus asked Christians in the Sermon on the Mount to be perfect, be perfect. And then they notice that that word perfect occurs another time in the gospel in chapter 19, where Jesus says to somebody who's rich, he says, if you want to be perfect, give away everything you have and come follow me. And so what these people did is they read this through their own culture. And by the way, that's what we all do. We all read this through our own world. So in their world, there were two types of Christians. There were, there were the monks and nuns and ascetics who had given away all their money and who were supposed to be celibate and chaste, right? And who were not supposed to uh, participate in violence. And so they looked around their world and said, you know what? These people over here are doing a pretty good job of living closely to what Jesus says, right? They're living closely to what Jesus says. And then there are the run of the mill Christians, the run of the mill Christians. They have to get married. They have to work. They have to store treasure up on the earth. Uh, they have to reproduce. Uh, they have to do all these things. So what, what you end up with is an idea that there are two sorts of Christians. And that's because there are two ways of life. And this is a very old way of thinking. It's not just medieval Catholicism. So um, uh, maybe some of you have been to Israel. Maybe some of you have been to the Dead Sea. Maybe some of you have seen the caves of Qumran, heard some guy lecture, you know, out, out in front of the caves there over by the, the Dead Sea where you floated on your back and it was a lot of fun. Anyway, the, the site there is where some Jews lived before Jesus. And these Jews have left documents. And if you read these documents carefully, they already know about two ways of life. That is, there are the people who live in the desert, and they are, it appears, ascetics, and they do have um, common property. They don't own anything. But there are also members of this group or sect that live in the cities, and they trade, and they marry, and they have children. So the world for these people is already divided into, I don't know, the superior and the inferior or to the full-time religious and then the amateur athletes over here. Uh, it really is a sort, sort of like professional athlete versus amateur athlete. And it's a recognition that not everybody can live the same way. So this is an old way of thinking that not all imperatives imply, uh, apply to everybody in the same way. And by the way, folks, I actually think that this is true of Jesus. That is, I do not think he walked around the countryside asking everybody to do the same thing. If you read through the Gospels carefully, there are some really radical things that appear to be addressed to just the 12, to the little group that followed him around. He says, you know, when you go out on a journey, don't take a staff and don't take in a, a bag for gold or silver. He's talking to missionaries. He's not going around telling everybody to get rid of everything they have. When he says, for example, to this guy who says, I'd like to follow you, but I want to bury my dad first. Jesus says, uh, let the dead bury their own dead, right? You all remember this? It's one of the harshest things Jesus ever said. I don't think he walked around Galilee telling everybody, don't bury your dead. I think this was an imperative to one guy that he wanted in his little group, and he was asking him to leave his life and follow him. So when he asked uh, the sons of Zebedee to leave their boat and to come and follow him, I don't think he's canceling the fishing industry. I don't think he's saying there's anything wrong with uh, making a living with your boat and nets. What he's doing is he's saying, I have a, a mission. It's really important. And some people are going to have to leave their regular lives and come and live differently. I think Jesus already has a sort of double standard or two-tiered way of thinking. There are some people from whom he asks things 
that he doesn't ask of others, okay? I think that's in the, the Gospels, folks. And one of the problems with the Sermon on the Mount is that I agree with John Calvin. John Calvin said, you know what? I don't think Jesus preached the sermon at one point in time as a sermon. This is John Calvin. So if you're Presbyterians, you can't get mad at me. I'm just passing on the John Calvin idea here. He said, I think the, the evangelist Matthew has obviously brought together things that Jesus said on various occasions. He's conveniently put them here in one place. Now, if Calvin is right, that means we don't really know the original audience for all of these things. And I think some of these things may well have been addressed to the little group that followed him and had to leave family, had to leave businesses and so on. That's really radical stuff. But I don't think they're addressed to absolutely um, absolutely everybody. So there is something, it seems to me, to, um, to this notion. Uh, and I'm, I'm given our time constraints, I'm just going to say that I really do think that these words, these imperatives are going to impinge upon different people differently. We all live in different contexts. Some of us are well-to-do, some of us are poor, some of us are rich, some of us are missionaries just living day to day uh, on the, the, the grace of the people around them. And they're going to hear and apply these sayings, it seems to me, very, very differently. And that's the, the element of truth that's here, because I think it's already there. Um, I think it's already there for Jesus. I think he's already got an inner group, and he speaks a little differently to them than he does uh, to everybody else, okay? All right. So that's what I want to do with the, the, the second one. I'm not going to spend much time on the, the third one, but I do want to mention it. So you are all at least nominally Presbyterians, right? I don't know if any of you grew up as Lutherans, but if you hang around Lutherans and talk about the Sermon on the Mount, it's very strange because what you'll discover is that they've been taught since they were very little that Jesus knew that human beings could never do these things, could never live the Sermon on the Mount, couldn't, couldn't do them. And what Lutherans do with this is what they do with everything, right? Caricature a little bit. For Lutherans, everything is grace. Everything is grace. Everything is grace. Nothing is works. So their interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus, Jesus asks us to do these things, knowing that we won't do them, but wants us to try. And once we try our best, what will happen? We'll realize we can't do these things. We can't live all these radical saints that I quoted at the beginning. And once we fail, what, what are we left with? We're just left with the grace of God. Now, this seems a little odd to me. It's never been something that I've been uh, keen on, this approach to the Sermon on the Mount. It really scares me that the, the whole gospel of Matthew ends with, you know, you're supposed to teach all the nations to obey all that I have commanded you. Seems to me that must include the Sermon on the Mount. And there's no footnote saying, uh, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you, even though I know none of them can do it. There, there's nothing like that there. And in fact, the Sermon on the Mount ends with this parable about building on the rock. And you're supposed to do these words and live them. So I'm very uneasy with this. I'm all for grace. I'm not speaking against grace people. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Protestant, okay? I'm all for grace. And I'm also I also recognize that we're frail and sinful and we fail all the time. But, 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 uh, I don't think this is the way to think about the Sermon on the Mount, folks. So, uh, so there's the absolutist approach. There's the monastic approach. And then there's the, uh, Lutheran uh, grace approach, all right? So what I'd like to do now in the time we have left before we have some discussion, if there is any, uh, I'd like to introduce a fourth approach and it's the, the approach I grew up in and it's the approach that I have, I have uh, defended sometimes, other times I've attacked it. By the way, I should say that that 
that um, trying to live the Sermon on the Mount really is uh, hard. And there have been times when I've, you know, I've tried to take my Christianity seriously. Um, the Sermon on the Mount gave me great problems. Um, uh, my uh, senior year of high school and the first year of college. So I came along at the end of the, the Vietnam War. They were still drafting, but people weren't being, uh, you know, called to do anything. But there was still a draft and there was always the remote possibility that the war would start up again. So uh, I was all enthusiastic about my faith as a, a high school student. And so I decided to register as a conscientious objector. And I wrote a letter, which was full of the Sermon on the Mount. And I said, I won't uh, go to war and I won't enlist in the army because Jesus said, and then I quoted uh, large tracts of Matthew five. The reason this was so hard was not, the government didn't care at that point, uh, you know, just, just some uh, liberal kid who doesn't know anything will just throw his letter over here in the file. The problem is, th is that my father was a soldier in the world in World War II, and he had been in Germany, and he had shot people, and people had shot at him, and he thought that he had done the right thing. He thought that it was right to go and defeat Hitler. And he couldn't believe that his son would think that this was wrong. My father was also there for the freeing of one of the Jewish death camps. He had seen firsthand uh, how people had been abused and mistreated. And he could not believe that his son was against what he had done, that his son was opposed to picking up a gun and um, defeating evil. We also had these horrible discussions about Hiroshima because my father finished in the European theater and he came back and they were training him for the invasion of Japan. And he, he would always tell me, son, you know, if they hadn't dropped the bomb, you probably wouldn't be here because they would have put me on a boat and I would have, uh, you know, been in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And, uh, you know, they estimated a million dead U.S. soldiers or whatever the number was. Uh, anyway, the point wasn't whether he was right or whether I was right. Uh, we had a fantastic, wonderful relationship. He was a great man, a great person. And this was the only conflict we ever had, arguing about Jesus and what he meant in the Sermon on the Mount. And it created a great deal of anxiety and he was very disappointed in in me later on happily later on happily when i wrote my book on the sermon on the mount i decided he was right and i gave up my pacifism uh unfortunately he was dead by that time so he didn't see that book um maybe he saw it in the afterlife okay one more thing and then i'll i'll i'll, I'll shut up today okay one one more thing so we've looked at these three approaches there's one more approach I'd like to introduce very briefly here in the time we, we have left. So I'll do this. This will take five minutes and then we'll see if there's, there's any time for, for questioning. So the monastic approach says that we have to think in terms of two sorts of Christians. This approach called the two kingdoms approach says that instead of dividing Christians into two, we need to divide life into two. And this makes the very common sense observation that there's a private sphere and a public sphere. There's the sphere of the individual, and then there's the sphere of government. There's the sphere of religion, then there's the secular sphere, right? There are two sorts of spheres. And the claim here is that the Sermon on the Mount speaks to the private religious individual. It does not speak to the state. It does not speak to the secular sphere. And then this becomes a way of solving our problems. So for example, when this becomes popular, uh, a popular way of thinking, especially in German Lutheranism in the 17th century, when it becomes popular, people ask questions such as this. Well, can you hold the office of public executioner? So can you take an ax 
and walk to the public square. And if the state says, cut off the, the, the guy's head, the criminal's head, can you do it? The standard answer was, yes, you can do this because you're not cutting off heads as a private citizen. You can't cut off heads as a private citizen. You don't cut off heads as a Christian. You cut off heads holding an office given to you by the secular state that has the sword given it to it by God uh, to uh, allude to, to Romans 13. So I saw a, um, a wonderful illustration of this two kingdoms approach uh, in my own in, a, in my own life um, in the 1980s. So um, my, my best friend was run over by a drunk driver in 1987. And uh, she survived in a coma for a month, and then she she passed on. So a drunk driver smashed into her car. That's why she died. Now, her parents were very, very pious Baptists, very pious Baptists. And after their daughter died, they met with this man. And they prayed for him and they prayed with him. Uh, they thought he needed help. They tried to get him into, I guess they helped uh, get him uh, temporarily into a, a program for, for drinking and so on. So on a private level, a Christian level, an individual level, they forgave him. But in terms of the court system, the secular world, public life, when the district attorney said, will you come to court and testify against this man? They said, yes, of course, he should be in prison. People who do this should be punished. So what they were doing was they were turning the other cheek in their private life, which was very painful, you can imagine, uh, trying to minister to somebody who's killed your daughter. But as members of the, uh, the community, the larger civil community, they thought that he should be punished. You can't get away with crimes like this. You, you, have, to, um, you have to separate then um, how you behave uh, individually as a Christian and then how you behave as, as a citizen. Okay, now I think that there must be some truth in this way of thinking. And I was, I was deeply impressed by this. The, now, if you had asked these people that I've just talked about, these Baptists, they wouldn't know anything about the two kingdoms. They wouldn't know anything about the, the background to what they're doing. They just did it because it was the tradition they were, they were, they were raised in. Um, but when people have talked about this as a sort of theory, I'll tell you what they have done since the 1940s. What they've always done when, when they've discussed this if, is they brought up the problem of German Lutherans in the 1940s, German Lutherans and the Nazis, because there were many people who went to church on Sunday, and then during the week they did what the state told them to do, and sometimes the state told them to do hideous, horrible things. And most of us don't admire them for this. We admire the people that hid Jews, right? And who disobeyed and who did not follow what uh, the government wanted. So the problem here with the two kingdoms approach is that in part, it, it sort of assumes that you have a decent kingdom or a halfway decent government, right? That you have something other than the, the Nazis. But, you know, that's not good enough. Uh, if, so the, the, the federal government now allows capital punishment. Now, I'm personally opposed to capital, capital punishment on principle. The fact that the state approves, now I may be wrong, uh, we're not going to talk about capital punishment here, but the very fact that I live in a country which says it's legal doesn't settle it for me, does it? There has to be a way of standing outside of the state and critiquing the state or criticizing the state or wondering about the state. Just because the state says it's time to go to war now doesn't mean that it's a just war or that it's a right war. So it seems to me that 
um, the Old Testament prophets here are, are the example. The Old Testament prophets are people who are criticizing government, institutions, uh, and they're doing it from a religious point of view. I think that whether or not we follow the king to, two kingdoms approach in some ways, we also have to see its limitations and we have to we have to think ultimately that if we're going to think in terms of, of giving to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God the things that are, are God's, that God has to trump Caesar and God has to evaluate Caesar and God has to measure Caesar. By the way, I just quoted that, that text about uh, Caesar. Jesus does there seem to recognize at least nominally some sort of uh, uh, separation of spheres, right? And it's also the case, folks, I, you have to admit this, no matter what you think, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is not addressing Caesar. He's not addressing Roman soldiers. He's not addressing the government. He is addressing Jews who are living uh, under a, an occupying military force, right? And they don't really have much political power. So that also has to, has to, uh, factor somehow into all this. Okay, so by my clock, uh, I've spoken enough. So if there are any questions at this point, I'll be, I'll be happy to take them. And of course, if they're not, uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to head off to the grocery store, which is <laughs> my next errand for the day. Well, we have some great information in the chat. I'm gonna... Um... Welcome folks, uh, Brent, Wade in and Kyle, for you guys to unmute yourself and ask your questions so that everyone can participate. Should we verbalize those questions now that we had um, logged? I, um, I just, I, I was hearing you saying sort of there's two, you know, kind of um, rules like, hey, some people, you know, you got to do this and other people like you're off the hook, you do this or whatever. But at some level, it seems to me that Jesus was kind of speaking to each person's individual, to their heart or to their call or to their mission. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it, it might not just be like, you know, two camps, you got to do oh, it, okay. but more like a, a, a million different or an infinite number of different, you know, approaches, not two, but maybe many. Um, and I just, what do you, I mean, that may be not in the typology, but is 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 that another way to interpret that bimodal thing? Sure, sure. I have yes, I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly, but uh, it's not in the typology that I was talking about. And I also do think it's helpful when reading the gospel to always ask yourself, do you know to whom this was addressed, right? And so, so just just give me. I, 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 I'll take a minute here to give you one illustration. So there's that beautiful, wonderful passage in Matthew 6 about looking at the birds of the air and the, the lilies of the field, and they don't work at all. They don't toil, but God takes care of them and so on. I've never heard a convincing sermon on that. I really haven't. It's very beautiful, and everybody likes it. But everybody in the congregation, uh, or the congregations that I've been in, they're always working. They have jobs, right? Or if they don't, they're unemployed and they want to work, right? Uh, I've always had to, to work. So I actually, if, if I could guess, I think Jesus was probably originally speaking to this little group of followers who were not working and who had to live off of whatever was given to them. You know, he sends them out on a mission and says, you don't, just don't take anything, right? And it would make sense in to that group to say, don't worry, don't worry about your clothes, don't worry about uh, your money, uh, you know, people will feed you, uh, some people will welcome you, just trust in God, it, it's going to be okay, right? That would make sense, but I find it really hard to think Jesus walked around Galilee talking to people who were mending their nets and saying, eh, look at the birds, they don't do anything, I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. Right, so this is one of the reasons I think Calvin is right that um, these sayings have been brought together, and we don't always know the original audience. But for that one, I, I just conjectured. I just gave you my reason for conjecturing the original audience. But um, Jesus certainly speaks differently to his enemies, right? 
then to his friends and to those who follow him, to those who don't follow him. And uh, just one more point. I, if you look at uh, Luke 19, that's the episode of Zacchaeus. It looks to me like he's speaking to Zacchaeus. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to generalize that. He's just looking at this guy, reading his heart, saying, okay, what do we have going on here? Well, it's funny because in that one, he seems to be speaking about, about money and tithing. And to somebody who gives all her two, two, two bits, you know, he's like, well, that's great for you. And yes. so, like these person gave half, I'll give half of all I own. He's like, great, 50% for you. And <laughs> like, other people, it's like, well, you got to give everything you got. And then you give a 10th and it's kind yeah. of depends on the person and how he, he's ministering, it seems personally to each person's heart. And, and actually that's good news, right? You want Jesus to, to be like that and to recognize that we're all different in different situations. Yeah. It, gives some, it gives some argument for the progressive tax system, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? So I, I heard the gas tax just went up nine cents in, in New Jersey. Is that right? Praise the Lord. Uh, let's all go to electric. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just had my first Tesla ride. I didn't like it. I was petrified. Nobody was driving. The car was just, oh, I didn't like it. But anyway, you're right about, so if you're poor, nine cents a gallon is horrible. If you're rich, it doesn't matter. It's not fair. I don't, I don't, I, yeah, I don't know what the political solution is, but it's not fair. I don't like it. It's everybody equally. Okay, enough of that. Any, anything else here? So I, I uh, asked a question there in the chat just out of curiosity uh in that fourth view um i'm wondering how does a christian live out their private faith in a public sphere or it's sort of you know is there is there a connection between private faith and how to function in the public or are they always sort of destined to be separate yeah so the the caricature of this position is that they're des they're destined to be separate but uh, I, I would say it's a case-by-case -case basis. So Augustine is interesting here. Augustine says, if somebody strikes me, I will turn the other cheek. But if somebody strikes my neighbor, I'm going to stop it, right? So he will actually um, defend the innocent and live differently if they're being oppressed. He says that, you know, he's not married and uh, he's a bishop and, you know, he can live some of this stuff uh, literally in ways that he doesn't want other people uh, to do. Anyway, one of the themes next week uh, is that I don't think the Sermon on the Mount saves anybody from thinking. I actually think it's a bunch of prods to, to make you think and rethink. And um, what the question you ask is something that you always have to ask. You're, you're always going to be asking it. Uh, it seems to me, unless you live in an Amish village uh, and, and follow the rules, or you live in a, uh, a Roman Catholic monastery and, you know, you just do the Benedictine rule and it's fine. But that's not where most of us are, right? Dave Letcher, you were going to ask a question a bit ago. I just had to, I just had to unmute myself. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I think that uh, personal choice is a very important factor here. Uh, each, I think I get, I'm getting the impression, given the approaches that uh, Dr. Allison gave us, is that the uh, it, it really relies on personal decision making and choice as to which way you go, which approach you take. That's an impression I have. Yeah, so I'll I'll leave you, I'll reinforce that impression next week. Okay. <laughs> All right. So yeah, you're you're right. No. Well, we've come to 1215, so I want to um, wrap it up. We all of us have other things, but thank you, Dr. Allison. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna recommend that for homework, we read, reread the Sermon on the Mount for next week. And uh, this has been recorded, so it will be posted. And um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Al. Appreciate okay, it. thank you very much. Right. Take, care. Take care. See you next week. Thank Bye. you.